Well, welcome to Ray's Reflection, a common man's Bible study. Today we're going to be dealing with uh, Peter's sermon or one of the events that occurred at, uh, on the day of Pentecost last week. We talked about some of the events, the miraculous events, especially we concentrated on the one known as the speaking tongues. And uh, today we're going to deal with or, or introduce Peter's sermon. Let me read the portion. It says, uh, verse 13, the reaction to hearing people speaking in tongues, here's the reaction. It says, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, ye men of Galilee and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken of through the prophet Joel. Now, many times when we deal with this portion of scripture, we concentrate, or most teachers will concentrate, on the substance of the sermon. But what we, and what we tend to forget or brush over is uh, Peter and the work of the Holy Spirit through Peter. You must remember when you go back to speaking in tongues, especially verse 4 of chapter 2, it, it says, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. In other words, they were, the word filled here means to be controlled. They were all controlled by the Holy Spirit and they began to speak with other tongues. And here it is, as the Spirit gave them utterance. In other words, what you see in the day of Pentecost is the work of the Holy Spirit, not the work of men nor the work of Peter as he preaches his sermon. If you remember in the introduction of the book, I said that maybe it has been misnamed. Instead of being the Acts of the Apostle, maybe it should have been the Acts of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, we would probably get a better picture of what's happening. Now, why I say that is because when you look at this sentence in verse 14, it says, But Peter standing up. Now that, we don't think much of that. We always think of Peter being bold and brave and he stands up and he, he's the leader of the cause. But that was not so. This is a milk toast. This is the same one who could not stand and, and, and uh, claim Jesus Christ as his followers in front of a, of a maid. And he cowered. He denied the Lord three times. In other words, he was big and brash when it didn't cost him anything, but when it was about to cost him something, he wouldn't, he wouldn't stand up. Now all of a sudden on the day of Pentecost, you see a complete turnaround. These men who are mocking him, many of those men in that crowd uh, are men who were yelling, 50 days earlier were yelling, crucify him, crucify him. So Peter is exposing himself to a, quite a bit of danger, a possible danger here. And yet he bravely stands up. So what you see is you see the work of the Holy Spirit in the person of Peter. Now he also says to them that he tells them to listen to what he's got to say. And he says, these men are drunk. It's too early in the day to be drunk. And, and therefore this he's introducing custom. They didn't drink wine that early in the morning. And, and therefore uh, he's saying that this is not what you think it is. Now he's going to turn around and he's going to introduce something they've already had. He says this, he says, but this is that which was spoken through the prophet Joel. Now remember, Joel is a book in the Old Testament and these men that he is speaking to have been reading the Old Testament all their lives. So now you, you, he's looking at them and saying, okay, you, I'm going to teach you, I'm going to tell you what this is out of the very things that you have read and have, have studied. Now here's the question. He's going to take, take things that they've already had. In fact, there is very little here that he tells them that they don't know. The problem is they just haven't put it together. Now why not? If you remember when I first started this Bible study, I dealt the second lesson dealt with darkness. You remember in 1 John chapter 1, it talked about and the darkness, 
the light shined in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it or could not understand it. And I dealt with these men being in darkness. In other words, uh, men who are unsaved cannot understand the things of God or the light from God or the teachings from God unless God shows it to them. And here are men who have had the scriptures, which Peter is going to teach them on, and yet they could not understand what it meant. Because when the, the, the fulfillment of that scripture appears to them, they don't, they don't, make, they don't connect the dots. And, and which, is, which tells you that these men were in darkness. And unless the Holy Spirit opens their eyes, all the words Peter says uh, will not come to fruition. Now the other thing I have taught during the, during the Bible study is this. Do you remember the power of the Holy Spirit? I said, how it works. I said, remember a man stands in a pulpit and he states a certain sentence in a certain way. And nobody moves. It's, it goes right over everybody's head. Nobody is affected by it. Another man will step into the pulpit and he will say the exact same sentence, word for word, and hearts are broken. And you ask yourself, well, what is the difference? <laughs> the difference isn't in the man <clears throat> and in his ability to be a great orator. The ability is in the Holy Spirit. One man is speaking in his own power. The other man is speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it is the Holy Spirit that affects the words that are said. So here are men who are going to be given scripture or light that they have already had. <clears throat> and... Now the Holy Spirit is here. Now the Holy Spirit is going to give them understanding. How do we know they're going to understand? How do we know they're not going to stay in darkness? Well, I'm going to jump to the end of the sermon. And at the end of the sermon, we find that 3,000 men got saved and accepted Christ. So when you, when you look at uh, what, uh, the teachings of the Holy Spirit, you see that in their darkness, the light shined and they got an understanding and they responded to it or at least 3,000 of them responded to it so when Peter is standing and he stands up and preaches he's not preaching to a handful of people he's preaching to a crowd of well over 3,000 people so let's begin with what he's saying he's saying this here's what Joel's prophecy says and it shall come to pass in the last days saith the Lord, that I will pour out my spirit upon the flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servant and on my handmaid I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke, and the sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood before the great and terrible uh, notable day of the Lord come and I shall and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved now let us understand what he's saying here he said and it shall come to pass in the last days now we need to understand what the last days are because we have two time periods that are listed here one is the last days, which are mentioned here, and the other one is in verse 20, which is the notable day of the Lord. Now, the word notable is not just saying it's a wonderful day of the Lord. The word notable talks about uh, a great dimension of dread and coming with it, and, and we see it, and we, we see it in uh, these signs here, the, the, the sun darkening, and the, the moon uh, turning to blood. Now we look at this and we say, okay, before we start, let's take a look at this prophecy. This is what we call a near and far prophecy. And you say, well, what is what is what here? Well, let's first understand this. Was, in the day of Pentecost, was the sun darkened? The answer is no. The sun was darkened when Christ was crucified. It was darkened for three hours. <laughs> was the sun darkened here on the day of Pentecost? The answer is no. Did the moon turn to blood on the day of Pentecost? The answer is no. Then 
why would Peter say this is the fulfillment of Joel's prophecy? What you have is you have a near and a far prophecy understood by the term last days. Now, the near prophecy is a sample of, of things that are going to occur. For example, you see a pouring out of the Holy Spirit uh, upon these 120 individuals, and you see them prophesying, and they prophesy in various tongues. Okay, now if you if you look very carefully, you don't see that any along the way much more beyond beyond that. Though you do see it in the Book of Acts, etc. But in the in the year 800 or the year 1000 or the year 1500, that kind of has has died because the maturity of the church has has occurred, and there's no need for that. Now you ask yourself, what was the need of miracles in the early church? And there were miracles, there were speaking in tongues, there were healings, there was raising from the dead, and yet we don't see these things today. And the reason is very simple. A new thing is coming into the world. A new proclamation, a new word of God. Uh, the Bible will, be, will start being to be written, and it, it will be a New Testament. How do you know it's true? Well, here comes a miracle that can only be from God, and therefore, because it can only be from God, you make the association. You associate the miracle with what is said. In other words, the miracles substantiate what is said. When the Bible is completed, then if you want to examine an event, etc., you measure it, you go back to the, 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 the New Testament, you go back to the Bible, and you examine it to see if it holds up to the teachings of the scriptures. But until then, the scriptures weren't written. The New Testament wasn't written. So you had to have some way to substantiate what was said. So these men standing and looking at Peter, and they're looking at the apostles, they're looking at people who are preaching this, and how do we know you're telling us the truth? Here's a miracle to substantiate that truth. And this is what, what we have here. So therefore we have a near prophecy and a far prophecy. The near prophecy is seen in the last days. What is the last days? As compared to the day of the Lord. The last day is a time from Pentecost until the day of the Lord, which we know to be the tribulation. Until that period of time, that large period of time, it's called the last days. Now, in our, this particular case, it's been almost 2,000 years. Now, when the notable day of the Lord comes, it's a day of or tribulation when the Lord sends these supernatural judgments upon the earth, and you see wonders in the sky, according to uh, some of the, the seals' judgments that are mentioned in uh, Revelation chapter 6, and you see all this phenomena going on, God's last attempt to get mankind to accept him as, as Savior. So what you have here is you have a sample. Let me give you an example of what it's like. Let's say you come home and your wife or your mother is uh, preparing supper or cooking a cake or whatever, and you stick your finger in to get a taste and you taste it. And that gives you a sample of what is to come. In other words, it's a sample of what the meal will be like. Well, this basically is what Peter is doing. He's saying, in the last days, certain things I'll pour out my spirit. And then before that, no, before, and you notice the word in, in, in verse, uh, verse 20, it says, before that great. So in other words, this pouring out of the spirit is going to occur before that great notable day of the Lord comes. In other words, before that seven-year tribulation period comes, just before the Lord makes his appearance. <clears throat> so uh, you have the near prophecy, which the little sample of what is to come occurred at Pentecost, and then the fulfillment of that is going to occur, in this case, 2,000 years later. So that's the difference between the two, the two periods of time, the last days and the, the, the day of the Lord. Now what he says is, he says, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Now he doesn't say I will pour out my spirit just upon the Jew. He will pour out his spirit upon 
all flesh. In other words, the Gentiles are included here. <clears throat> he says, and your sons and your daughters, notice the role of the women that have been elevated here in Christianity, <clears throat> they shall prophesy and your young men shall see visions and your old men shall see dreams. Now, visions and dreams in today's world, when we look when we in America look at visions and dreams and we look at prophecy, we look at this pouring out of the Spirit, uh, we don't look at it biblically. If a person says he has a vision or he had a dream, uh, that sort of thing, God spoke to him in that, we tend to dismiss him as a little bit crazy, a little bit wacko. Yet, if you and I would suggest that you read this book, Inside the Revolution by Joel Rosenberg. You'll find that God is pouring out His Spirit. And the problem in America is we don't think this is happening today because it's not happening to us or to many of us. And those of us who, uh, who it is happening to, we, we, we sort of dismiss it. But I will tell you this, if Joel Rosenberg's testimony is right, and I believe it is right, etc., God is pouring out His Spirit. And where He's pouring out His Spirit is in the Arab nations. And there are Arabs who are receiving, who are receiving visions and dreams from uh, God, etc., and multitudes are getting saved. And to give you an example, we think of, of the growth of, the, of a church, and we think the fastest growing religion in America is, the, is, is Islam or the Muslim religion. And what we look at, and, and, and that is true, the fastest growing religion in the world is Christianity. And it is occurring, the greatest, in, the greatest increase is occurring in the Arab nations because men are seeing visions and men are see, dreaming dreams. And men are running to look for Christ because they're being urged to look for Christ. So, uh, I suggest you read that book. It is, it is an excellent book. And, and therefore, when we look at visions and we look at the dreams, these visions and these dreams don't save anyone. Only Christ can save. But they do cause people to be motivated to search the scriptures. And he says this, And on thy servant and on my, my handmaiden I will pour out in those days, those days indicating in the, the last days of that whole entire period of my spirit and they shall prophesy and they shall teach and they shall say things now be clear and understood that when you stand up and when you hear people speaking in tongues they must be speaking in a tongue that is understood they cannot be st speaking in battle <clears throat> and therefore you need to clarify that languages were an indication that uh, on the Gentiles, etc., that they were condemned. You, it, it is not. It is not one of Revelation. Now it says this, and I will show in the heavens above, in the signs of the earth beneath, blood, fire, vapor, and smoke. Now that is, it, if you look into the old and uh, the New Testament, into the Book of Revelation, you will see some of the great phenomena that occur in the universe, and uh, these are the things that part of Joel's prophecy that in the latter days, and the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord. And that would that is, is going to happen. But here's what's the amazing thing is, it, what is available to mankind during the last days or during the days when God is pouring out His Spirit. He says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <coughs> almost too easy isn't it it's so easy and yet it is so universal and that men don't call on the name of the Lord men need things to call on the name of the Lord men need phenomena and so on yet here it is you calling on the name of the Lord is literally accepting Jesus as your Savior he says you do that and you are automatically saved the thing that is not mentioned here, and I'm going to mention it, is this. 
People have called on the name of the Lord for years and not been saved because they've called on his name to get them out of trouble. In other words, what we call a foxhole conversion. In other words, they, they will deal with God. If you get me out of this problem or you get me out of this dilemma, I will do this. And that, that is not the issue here. The issue here is you are calling on the name of the Lord for salvation. Therefore, you have to have an element of faith. So if you call on the Lord, <laughs> in the name of the Lord, because you know He will save you because He has promised to save you, then that promise is true if you believe it to be true. In other words, there must be an element of faith involved. And then he says this, Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, now notice he says this, A man approved of God among you by miracles. In other words, this man, Jesus of Nazareth, came down and he made many miracles, and you found him to be approved. You approved of him because you loved the miracles that he did. You loved the healings that he did. You loved the raising of the dead that he did. You loved all the things that he did. And you assumed that he was a man from God. Yet, he did wonders and signs which God did by him in right in the midst of you. And you yourselves also know. He says, in other words, you can't deny it. You know that to be true. He says, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, you have taken. Now notice what he's saying. Jesus Christ was delivered by a determinate counsel. The word counsel here would be the will. In other words, the determined will of God determined that Jesus Christ would be taken and he would be crucified. And this was by the foreknowledge of God. Now the foreknowledge of God isn't just knowing something was going to happen ahead of time, it is actually knowing it's going to happen because you're causing it to happen. So therefore, in this predetermined counsel, predetermined will of God, God determined and made sure it, it came to fruition and that this was going to happen. Then he turns around and he says this, and ye have taken. Now, it was the Romans who uh, crucified Jesus. And the reason the Jews are guilty here is because the Jews had to go to the Romans for capital punishment. In other words, if we are going to uh, kill anyone for crimes committed, etc., it had to be carried out by the, 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 the ruling nation. And, and the ruling nation, in other words, the Jews were allowed to control themselves and rule themselves, etc., except the capital punishment was reserved for the Romans only. So if the Jews had a person that needed to be crucified or needed to be put to death, then they would have to go to the Romans to petition him. And this is what he, he did. He said, you have taken, therefore you have been guilty. He says, and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain him. Now, wicked hands are this. And I'm going to finish with this. Wicked hands, you must understand, if the Romans had a legal right to crucify or put to death someone, and they put to death a murderer. The murderer was tried, the murderer was found guilty, and he was sentenced to death, and the Romans then took and crucified him. This would not be wicked hands. This would be justice. God had given permission for capital punishment, and the Romans were carrying out that capital punishment. This is not the case here. These hands are wicked because they're carrying out an execution on an innocent individual. That is why Peter turns around and accuses them of having wicked hands. In other words, you did this and it was not a legal thing what you did. It was an illegal thing. You condemned an innocent man, therefore your hands are wicked. <clears throat> now, these facts they've known not only the facts about Joel's prophecy, they have been reading it all their lives, they knew what it was, but these facts about Jesus of Nazareth, they knew. Fifty days ago, this is what they did, and he's accusing them. Now you will notice at this point, they're not rebelling. They're not yelling at him and saying, hey, you're accusing us of something false. They're just listening. Why are they just listening? Because of the power by which he spoke. He spoke in the power of the Holy Spirit. 
And when he gave this accusation, you who illegally <coughs> crucified this man, they stood there and listened. As opposed, had he done this before, I believe, this is an opinion, I believe if he had done this before Pentecost, etc., they probably would have turned on him because he would not have been speaking in the, in the power of the Holy Spirit. But here he is speaking in the power of the Holy Spirit, therefore they are listening. Now the question, the last question you have to ask yourself is, what language was he using? Was he speaking in the Aramaic? Was he speaking in, in, uh, uh, in Hebrew? Uh, what, was he speaking in Greek? What was he speaking in? And for, the, for those of you who understand what happened at Pentecost, it doesn't matter. Because whatever language he was speaking in, they heard him in their own language. So there were 3,000 men there <coughs> who were, were from all around the Mediterranean Sea. And they, when the, Peter stood up and spoke, it made very little difference what language he used. They heard him in their own language. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. We're going to stop there, and we will continue... Uh, next time with the substance of this sermon up to this point there, there is there is a little that these men do not know reflect on what is said here and uh, we'll see you next week uh, God, we wish you Godspeed from on victory side